Locations, locations, locations. It's all about locations. These are, of course, the newest card type in Disney Lorcana's set three into the Inklands. We've had several weeks now, I guess a month or two with them, and I just kind of wanted to go over all of them, review how good I think they are, how good I think they aren't, which ones are worth using, which ones aren't, and just kind of overall about them in general. So this is going to be all about locations. And before we get into the individual locations, I just kind of want to talk about the thoughts in general on them. I do like the cards. I think they are a fun type to use. And I have enjoyed them more than I originally thought I would. I, I really wasn't sure what to think of when they were when they first came out. It was like, are these going to be too strong, too weak? And I think they've kind of fallen right in the middle where some of them are very strong, some of them are very weak. Conceptually, I think they... So the problem I guess I have with them is that they tend to exacerbate the issue that already exists in Disney Lorcana, which is going first is very strong. And I think locations make worse of what I call the chase, right? Usually in a game of Lorcana, one player will be setting the tempo and they're usually the first player, not always, but usually, and they will be setting the questing tempo because they're getting to play first, they're getting their characters down and they're questing, questing, questing. And then the other player is spending most of the game chasing that player which is why i call the the chase you know if you're going turn one curse merfolk turn two you know robin hood whatever and you're questing ahead of me i have to spend all of my resources challenging your characters and trying to remove your characters you'll see a lot of these games where in the end assuming the one player couldn't stabilize the lore counter is usually like 19 to 0 or you know 20 to 1 or 18 to 2 where it's all the lore is on one side because they are the ones who've been setting the tempo and getting to quest every turn and the other player just has to constantly respond to that and I do think locations kind of make that worse if you're ahead they just keep you that much further ahead you know if you're already winning and you can drop Queen's Castle or Legacy or Agrabah whatever location you like and your opponent, all they already can't deal with your characters. They're already trying to catch up to your characters. And now they have this other thing they have to deal with that's immune to a lot of damaging and removal abilities. They just, they just lose that much harder. Now, likewise, on the flip side, if you're behind, they don't really help you catch up. If, if you're trying to stabilize, there is a nice little middle ground in there where if you're trying to stabilize, dropping a location can slowly help build your lore. So it makes it, uh, when you get to that end game part, maybe you don't have quite as much lore to make up, but you have to be in the middle of stabilizing. You know, for example, let's say my opponent's playing aggro, you know, we'll say they're playing Amber Amethyst, turn one Maleficent, turn two Pinocchio, you know, they're questing with those, they bounce with Snake, all that. So, you know, let's say they've gone first, it's their turn four, they've quested for how much, already at 10 lore or whatever, and it's my turn four. I can't, <laughs> I can't just drop the queen's castle on turn four and go pass like that. Yeah, that doesn't help me. That's not going to help me catch up and win the game. Just like any of these four drop locations. So in those scenarios, when I have to be challenging your board, I have to be answering your cards. I can't afford to just drop a location and that's my whole turn. It's like, all right, well, that's <laughs> all I'm doing for the game. So I, I do like them, but I do think they really push that divide even further that again if you're winning they just put you even further ahead and if you're losing they don't really help you come back so part of the reason i think that is too and something i do think they kind of i don't know overlooked like they said they designed the first three sets together right so they should have anticipated this but one of my issues is, and I'm gonna, I've got a lot of bunch of cards here for examples. I think there are a lot of effects that should work, that should work on locations, that don't for some reason, right? So, for example, Rise of the Titans, we got in this set. It's a three cost inkable steel card that not only just it kills any location, it can also kill an item. So clearly, a very good card that some people honestly even cut because they think, well, if I don't run to locations, it's kind of a dead card, right? And I guess my question would be, is there a reason Dragonfire couldn't also banish a location? Right now, it just banishes a character. You really don't see this card anymore. It honestly fell out of favor pretty hard after set one. So this is uninkable, and it costs two more than Rise of the Titans. And Rise of the Titans just banishes any location. Why can't Dragonfire also banish a location? Does that give it utility that, yeah, it can hit a character or a location? Sure, it does, but it's a five-cost uninkable. If a three-cost inkable can do that, and it has another effect on it, 
I don't see why Dragonfire shouldn't be able to. Smash. Why can't you pay three to smash a location? Most people don't even play this card much anyway, as they just have different ways they prefer to attack characters, but... Or at least, it, you know, like at my locals, I don't know, maybe on Pixelborn it's more popular. But yeah, if I want to spend three, this can't be sung, and smash three damage on a location, why can't I do that? So now my, you know, Mim Fox doesn't have to deal, hit it twice, now she can hit it once for four, and here's another three. I don't think that would be insane. What about Maleficent Dragon? Why can't she banish a location instead of a character? Again, she costs nine. She's a late, she's one of the big late game threats that... I don't see why that would be any worse that she could banish a single location. You know, if, if I come in and they've got uh, Robin Hood, let's say the 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 one that quests for four lore, the Emerald one, and he's sitting there and I decide instead of blasting him, I want to blast away McDuck Manor. Why? I don't think that would be an issue. Scar, why doesn't he reset if he vanquishes a location? He resets if he vanquishes a character, but not a location? I mean, maybe they thought that would be too strong if, if because the locations don't deal him damage in return, which obviously characters can. But again, he's a seven cost uninkable. He, he hits six, so if they're playing locations out of that range, he's not going to do it alone. Like again, but that's what he does. That's what the card does. Is he's supposed to go and reactivate, go and reactivate. I, and, and I don't think that's a bad thing to have. A hey, this card's particularly good in this scenario. Uh, Hades, would that have been too strong that you can hit a location, put it into their inkwell? I don't think so. I mean, again, he's a seven cost uninkable that a lot of blue decks, this is a lot of them don't often even play anymore. You know, if you look at the Ruby Amber or the Ruby Sapphire list, most of the removal tends to be just the red removal. They don't tend to run Hades. If they want that effect, they'll use let it go. Milo Thatch. It would have been kind of interesting if, what if he put all locations back into their hands too? That could maybe give him some more utility. I don't know if that'd be enough to make him say see play. Probably not. But that'd be kind of neat that he just resets their board like that. Now, for most of the board wipes, since I just touched on that, I do think some of them make sense why they can't touch it, right? Which is why I have them on here. I think it makes sense that Be Prepared can't hit the locations because if you could just seven wipe out everything on their board, that would be insanely, insanely strong. I actually kind of like that locations can play around Be Prepared, that if you can put out two McDuck Manors and now, well, Be Prepared clears their bodies, but it doesn't deal with the locations. I personally find that interaction kind of neat. Same with Grab Your Sword. I understand they didn't just want Grab Your Sword to not only hit the entire board of characters to hit locations as well. That would be very strong. So those ones I kind of get. Uh, Tinkerbell, I, I think it would have been okay if she just, when she entered, she pinged every location for one. It's one damage. I don't think that's insane. And if she banished a location, why couldn't she still then deal two to another location or to a character? I, I don't think that would have been super strong. Here, Shere Khan and Queen of Hearts. How cool would it have been if their effects worked when challenging a location? Currently, they only work on challenging characters. These cards, maybe they would see some play as essentially some anti-location uh, tech. Because, hey, you can put those locations down, but I'm just going to challenge into them, and I can actually gain a bunch of lore and draw cards off of them. I would have think I think that would have been pretty neat. Uh, and then I just mentioned along or I have along came Zeus here because this is a good right. It's one of the reasons this card is so good. Obviously, a song that deals five damage is very very powerful. But the fact that it has that utility that you can also blast a location for it, making almost any location then being able to be taken out uh, early is is just very good. So th that's kind of my one thing with them is there there are certain cards that I think should have been able to hit locations. I don't think that would have been too strong. Maybe you, you think it would have been. So if you do, please let me know in the comments below why you think that would have been too strong. I can see certain arguments. I could maybe see an argument that Maleficence shouldn't, or again, that maybe Tinkerbell's effect shouldn't. But something like Dragonfire, it's like, well, you know, it's a five cost uninkable. If, if this can hit it, I don't see why that would be too strong. And if these cards had that ability, I think it would shrink that chasing gap that now... I have to deal with all your characters, but you also put locations behind them, and I can't possibly deal with both. Now, maybe I have... Okay, Scar actually can. I can take out that location, that location, and then hit your character as well. So, I don't know. We'll see. I mean, we won't see, because I don't think they're going to change that, but just uh, wishful thinking on my part. All right, let's break down the locations individually. Look at which ones I think are worth not worth using. Interesting that four of them actually got enchanted versions. I didn't realize there was that 
many of them. Quite a few uninkable ones, too, more than I had originally thought going through them. So kind of the gold standard we'll be going on is this smiling little guy right here. Not that he's little at all. This is Maui. This is the main location killer, right? He comes in, the turn he's played, he can immediately rush in, smack it for six. So for me, and I think for a lot of folks, there is kind of a Maui litmus test of does it die to Maui in one hit? And if it does, that's going to probably fall on the lower end. If it doesn't, tends to make it better, right? So you'll see locations with seven tend to be more valuable, and you've probably seen them played more often because they can't die to a single Maui hit. So a lot of these places, um, all the elements have, or elements, all the inks have one that essentially has no effects. It's just kind of a generic one. So Neverland, yeah, I mean, it's just, it's fine. It's cheap. That's a nice thing. There's not many reasons to move it here, but it's just cheap. You don't see it very often because of that. Pride Lands has certainly become pop more popular lately. It is uninkable, but it's only two. A two-cost location with seven willpower and it quests for one is quite nice. Plus, the effects are very good. Yeah, it's a little expensive to move someone there, but then it makes everything cheaper and it makes them stronger. So I think Pride Lands is very good because of that. You're getting a lot of value. And the the cost is important with these, and I'm going to explain it more with something like Tiana's Palace, right? So this is cost three. <laughs> Again, it's uninkable. Eight willpower and one lore. So those stats are really good. Three, eight, and one. And its effect is technically nice. Characters can't be challenged while here. But it is it costs two to move them there. So what kind of deck would want this? You you want a deck where you have high lore characters or maybe some character who generates some kind of passive effect to be there. But but essentially characters that you want to quest with, right? You don't really want to put a tragic beast here because beast tends to not quest anyway. If people get rid of beast, they're using spot removal for him. They tend to not be challenging him because you generally just don't exert him. So if you're playing an aggressive deck, which is where this would fit perfectly, right? If you're playing green amber or ruby, am or ruby amber, and you're or not ruby amber, amethyst amber, and you're trying to go quick, yeah, you would love to put Pinocchio here. You would love to put Lilo or Curse Merfolk here. But think about how that would have to work. So Pinocchio is out on turn two. You play this turn three. That's your entire turn three. Now on turn four, you have to spend two to move the Pinocchio there which means your turn four ink just got cut in half. Now you only have two left to do whatever it is you're going to do with. So, like, in theory, it sounds really good, right? Because now they have to out the Tiana's Palace before they can get to the Pinocchio. But, yeah, it's so costly to do that. You're essentially, you're actually just slowing yourself down. And, because as I showed here with something like Rise of the Titans is also a three-cost ink card, so if you're going first and you play this on turn three and they have Rise of the Titans in hand, they can just go, okay, gone <laughs> immediately. And you just, you paid three for absolutely nothing. So I think that is why a card like this struggles. And we're going to see that with some other cards coming up too. Uh, Forbidden Mountain. The six health is nice, especially on a two drop, but obviously it will die to Maui. And it only quests for one. That's the other big thing is two lore is such a huge difference versus one lore when it comes to these locations. I found that to make a, a startling difference. Queen's Castle, arguably the best one in the game. Actually, I don't think it's even arguable. I think it's, it's you can't deny it. So it's expensive, right? Cost four, but it has seven. So even if you play this turn four, you pass, it's their turn five, and they Maui it, that alone doesn't finish it off. They will have to do something else. Then the value you get out of this is nuts. Not only is it quest for two, it's only one to move it there. And for every character, you get to draw a card, which is frankly insane. I, I do think this card is a little overtuned. <laughs> I've heard some people, you know, calling for it to be banned. It's too powerful. I, I do think it's a little overtuned. Simply, here's what I would have changed. I think all the stats are fine. I would have just said, if you have a character here, you can draw a card. The fact that you can put like four characters there, three characters there, even two, and draw two cards off of it is absolutely nuts. Now, the nice thing is you really can't do that till turn five because, again, your turn four is to get this ink down. But still, with seven health, like it's 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 a beater. It's brutal. It just gets you too lower passively, and that draw is just... This is one you will see people, even if it's not necessarily a favorable play, they will go out of their way to destroy this thing because you just can't leave it there, right? You know, McDuck Manor, yeah, is heavy in a quest for two, but at least it's not getting them value beyond that, whereas this thing is, says, oh, no, I'm going to win the game if you let me just sit here and draw as many cards as I want. So, yeah, Queen's Castles 
Absolutely ridiculous. Sorcerer's Tower, I haven't really seen anyone use it outside of like draft pre-release other than a broom deck because it is expensive. Like it costs three. That's nice. And seven willpower is very good. So those stats are good, but it costs two to move there. And it itself doesn't generate any passive lore. It only gains extra lore to characters who are there, which is clearly great for the brooms, right? Because the brooms can move there for free. Now they all get plus one. So with the brooms, it's obviously good. I haven't seen anyone try to use it outside of that because I think it's just too too clunky and expensive. And again, it doesn't have any own passive one. So I like it with the brooms outside that, whatever. Uh, Deville Manor is just, you know, it's a basic cheap one. It's a, pretty much a copycat of Neverland. Fang. So here's one talking about the aggro decks, right? So any characters there gain ward and evasive, which is fantastic. Quest for two. I love that. Cost four. Eh move to eh, willpower six eh, eh, eh. it's a cool idea but again the characters you have there they want to be able to quest because that's what the evasive will do they can quest and they can't be challenged by stuff that doesn't have evasive the ward they can't be shot so you think this would be great in an aggro deck right of lemon lime again the problem is turn four this is your entire turn which means and it means if you pass and it's their turn five, again, here comes Maui, and Maui can just out it immediately. So it can die the turn it after it comes in, which is really bad. And let's say even they don't out it immediately, though, that you're going aggressive, they don't have a Maui, you put this down turn four, so now you're turn five, you want to move two people there, that's two ink a piece. That's basically your whole turn. You're going to have one ink left to do something with. So it's just too, it's too expensive. I wonder if... It either should have been cheaper, so it was more low to the ground, and then I think I would have rather seen it like really cheap, a one or a two, movement is one, uh, and then maybe less lore and less willpower to balance it out, but that way you could actually use it in a quick aggressive deck. I, I'm assuming their fear was that if it was too cheap, like if you did put it out turn one, and then suddenly you can't challenge this Lilo, in early game there tends to be a lot of hate challenging is how you get rid of cards so maybe they would have thought that would be too strong but again if you put out lilo turn one a hook and they put out hook turn two and even if you move lilo to here let's say again in this hypothetical that's way cheaper the hook just smashes into it for three and if it only had four or five health it's still gonna die in a turn or two so yeah i like the idea i really love the idea of the effect but this is just way too way too clunky and does not line up at all Cusco's palace is pretty much the same thing Love that it has seven. I like it costs three, but it only quests for one and the, the, the God, three cost to move it here. So this one, if you put down turn three, your next turn, almost your entire inkwell goes to moving a single character here who can still be challenged and killed. They'll just kill whatever challenged them. But that early again, what, what, what are you moving there that that is going to be that much of a payoff for you that they, if they just send captain hook in or Eric or the red queen with haste or even a mim Fox, like they don't care that it died and returned. I don't know. Yeah. Another one. That's just kind of clunky. Maybe if it quested for two, it'd at least be a little worth looking at. Cause a, a, a seven body two quester on three, that could have been quite good. But as of now, I've never even seen anyone use it. Agrabah for one of these kind of basic ones. I actually like quite a bit because it quests for two yes it has very low health at five but especially in the late game if you've just cleared with a be prepared and you put down an agrabah and a rls legacy or whatever it puts on a lot of lower pressure so for a blank one i like this one quite a bit and again this this seems really well balanced to me right hey it's a big lore quester the downside being it's relatively easy to get rid of that it's it's what it should be that's good balance you want your opponent to have an answer to it Jolly Roger is fun. Again, this is another one I think is pretty well balanced. I don't know if it needed to be uninkable, but I like that it costs one. I like that it doesn't have lore, and it can technically give any character rush, which is a huge effect, but it's a bit expensive to do that. But then your priors can move there for free. It's nice. And as your opponent, I a lot of times am okay, am okay just leaving this here just because, again, it's not putting lore pressure on, so rarely do I want to take the time to hit it for five. Sometimes maybe I have to if your pirates are getting a lot of rush but i like that it has a theme too and it clearly has hey we want these characters to exploit it so yeah i like jolly roger a lot same with rls legacy i go back and forth on this card clearly this is the premier location to use with jim hawkins eight willpower is massive there's only one location that has more than that it quests for two 
the effects are great. I think they really nailed the hit the <laughs> nailed the head, hit the nail on the head with this one. Again, man, if it was inkable, I would probably use it in all my Ruby decks. But maybe that's why they made it uninkable is because they didn't want you to just jam into everything, right? But coming off a of gym, not only is it thematic, it fits him. He moves here, which then instantly activates its second effect that it makes stuff cheaper and giving everything evasive is, is huge. It really is. So this one I really like. I like that it rewards you for investing in it, whether it's with Jim or again, even if you just move that first person there, yeah, that's expensive. But now suddenly it's just one to get everyone there. That's really cool. I like this one a lot. I sometimes wish I would use it more. But again, that uninkable just mm, gets me sometimes. But I, I really do like the design of the legacy. I think this one is is very well thought out. Next, we have Into the Blue stuff. Bell's House has an enchant. This one, I think, is absolutely terrible. I tried it originally with my item list. So it costs one. <laughs> and So at one cost with six willpower. That's good, right? Well, except it doesn't generate any lore. So it's on only effect. The only reason to have this is if you have a character here, you can pay one less for items. But the problem is it costs two to move a character there. So turn one, you play this. Turn two, you put out... Uh, who Scrooge McDuck, I guess the one that quests makes items cheaper. You could put out a red queen, you know, whatever two costs you think of now turn three, you spend your two ink, you ink a card. So you've got three ink to work with. You spend two to get someone here. You can't even fishbone quill now on three, which is normally what you want to do because it still costs two. And you only have one ink to work with. I mean, it lets you play popsicle for free. And that's cool. But I have yet to see a blue deck that's struggling with popsicle. And I kind of just think, uh, what is it? Scrooge's top hat is just, a, if you want a free popsicle, I think the top hat's just a better card to use. Yes, it's uninkable, but it also makes them free. You don't have to invest additional ink into it to get someone to stay there. It can't be outed as easily. It adds to Tamatoa's count. Yeah, if you want a, a reduction on an item, like, don't be wrong, this says play every popsicle for free play shield of virtue for free so like i can see the idea but that deck wants to ramp up on turn three anyway with the quill so it's just i don't know i don't know how they could have fixed this one obviously you can't go lower here <laughs> you could get maybe if it had lore maybe if it actually generated lore on its own that even if it was just one and this is a rare so they clearly valued that it they thought it was strong but i think it needed to generate lore and lore maybe reduce this to one as well Again, I guess they were afraid of that to be, but it's, you know, you have to invest in items to make this work. So, yeah, I think it needed lore above all else. Then we have McDuck Manor. Life is like a hurricane. Ah, good old DuckTales. This one is absolutely great in blue decks. It, it doesn't do anything. You know, it doesn't have any effects, but you don't care because it has nine health and quest for two. That's that's all that matters. So it's a queen's castle with two more health and no effects. And the movement is irrelevant because it doesn't have any effects. You don't really have a reason to even move there. I just do it to move people in when I have leftover ink. Just to say, hey, look at this nice mansion I've built. Great card. Yeah, it can't be outed by Maui in a single hit. That's why I play Fishbone uh, Maui's Fish Hook in those decks. So he can out it in a single hit. And yeah, a really good follow-up to board wipes, be prepared, Tinkerbells, whatever. We're just like, all right, well, you got to deal with these. You have to use two along game Zeus's on them. So yeah, for a card that doesn't have any effects, this one is completely carried by its stat line. So I, I hope it doesn't get just like power crept in a future set because with no effects, yeah, if anything comes out with similar stats and an effect, it'll just get replaced immediately. Great card though. I really like that one. And our final blue is Matanui. I have seen some recent uses for this where... So again, it costs two. So specifically what they'll do in, in the blue-red decks is turn two, they'll play Matanui. Turn three, they will play a card with Rush, like the Rocket Stitch for two or the Queen of Hearts for two. Spend the one to move them to Matanui. Attack, challenge, get rid of whatever it was. And then now they get that into the inkwell. I do really like that line, so now they're ready to go to five ink on the next turn. I don't know if it's better than just the natural fishbone quill one jump ahead line that those decks want to use to ramp up. So because of that, I think that's probably why you don't see this super, super often. I do think fishbone quill one jump, all that is just a bit more consistent. Uh, but other than that, like I like the idea of the card. Five cost. It, this does quest for one on like Bell's house, so at least it does put a little bit of pressure on your opponent that hey, you probably should get rid of this at one point. 
but I think when I first saw this, I thought the idea was, oh, you just move your characters here, quest with them, and then, you know, when your grandma Tala dies, well, she'd get put into the inkwell anyway. When, when your Flavorsham dies, he gets put into the inkwell. But if they really want to get rid of it at that point, they'll just hit the location directly. So I like this one. It's, it's neat. Finally, the steel ones. Uh, Maui's Place of Exile, I tried a few times. I actually do like it. I like the Resist Plus One. Uh, it's a shame it costs two. Maybe, again, maybe they thought it would have been too much if it cost one. But right now, again, costing two, so you have a character out on turn one. Turn two, <laughs> you play this. Then turn three, even if you move your character there, you now only have two ink to work with. And, and cutting off your ink, especially early, is very difficult to deal with. I kind of like it like it would be a neat um counter to steel decks and this is kind of one of these weird things they do with steel right in theory like what if in the late game you could put this out essentially as a cogsworth where you're protecting against grab your swords and tinkerbell as long as maui's place of e place of exile is here except <laughs> it dies to a long game zeus in one shot it's also within steel and i i ge genuinely don't understand why steel has the resist trait steel the ink that Auto, that does damage to everything is also the one that resists damage like no that feels like that should have been emerald or amber or something else so it's it's a cool idea but it's it dies to maui ironically enough in one hit and yeah you, you would think you'd want it earlier so i don't know it, it, i did enjoy my time playing with it but I think there's a reason you don't see it regularly. When you got to make slots, you know, you got to have slot calls. There's just not really much of a place for this. Nottingham's fine. And, you know, generic, no effect. But I, I like it for its stats. And Bayou. So Bayou, I actually like quite a bit. I like that, yes, it's one, one to move there, and it's three. So it's incredibly weak. Can die to many things. Can die to a hook. You know, that part sucks. But it has a very good effect that anything that quests there multiple you get to draw and discard and unlike the castle i think this one makes sense that any character can get that effect because it's not just pure card draw it's you're cycling your hand you're still giving something up so yes it's it's probably maybe too low of health maybe it could have used a four that way it can't just die to a single captain hook or a single you know rocket stitch madam mim fox snake whatever well, i guess a mim fox it would, would still kill a four but anyway so i i do like the idea of this one this one's fun so those are all the locations. Those are kind of my thoughts on it. It is an item type I have enjoyed in the game, although it is frustrating to be behind and have to chase the locations down now, which is quite impossible if you're that far behind. I am sure this is a type they will continue, so I'm interested to see what other ones they'll come out with. I wonder if we're going to get three of each color, just like this time, or if because this was the big set for them, that's why they did this, and maybe they'll just do one for each color. I wonder if we'll still go. I hope we don't just get, like, I hope we don't get the same cycle of them every set. Okay, there's one, you know, generic one that doesn't do anything, and then there's an un uninkable that maybe has an effect, and then there's the big one. You know, there's a rare, there's an uncommon, etc. So we'll see what they do. Let me know what you think. What locations are your favorite? How do you see them overall in the game? Do you really like what they've added? Do you not care? Are you indifferent? And what did you think about all the, you know, my examples of, hey, this stuff probably should have hit locations. Appreciate you watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Help out the channel. And we will see you next time with more great Disney lore kind of content. Until next time. Bye.